Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Okay. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind überall, von Lithuania bis zum Sahel, von Afghanistan bis Irak bis Libanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Oliker, here in Brussels. And I'm Hugh Pope, also in Brussels. All of us in our separate home studios. And in his own home studio in Illinois is the Crisis Group Head of Advocacy and Research for the U.S. program, Dan Schneiderman. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Oya and Hugh. Wonderful to be with you. So Crisis Group, for the very first time last week, put out a statement on events in the United States. Crisis Group has not traditionally written about the United States over its quarter century of existence. Dan, what is going on in the United States? Sure. So... First, I think it's important context for our listeners to understand that the murder of George Floyd was a clarifying moment and a moment of action. There were a number of events that I think led up to the sort of explosion of civil unrest and protests that you've seen over the last two weeks. There have been several other high profile murders of Black Americans, notably, and again, this is not to be exhaustive, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. Ahmaud Arbery was allegedly killed by two men following him in a car and chasing him while he was out for a run. Brianna Taylor was killed while she was at home during the execution of a no-knock warrant by police. A no-knock warrant means they don't have to knock on the door and tell you that police are coming in and entering. These kind of examples of police brutality mixed with a bottled up and pent up frustration on behalf of all Americans, but particularly, I think, on the minority communities in the United States who have been predominantly impacted by the economic and public health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic as they, at some level, do not have jobs or are not able to work from home, right? And they are working in industries that have been deemed essential and critical to keeping the economy functions, and so they have to continue to go to work every day. So all of those things, I think, combined into a very potent mix of pressure to create a moment where, after George Floyd was murdered, people felt compelled to go out into the streets and make clear that it was time for a pretty dramatic and systemic change. And you you saw, over the course of a two-week period, consistent daily crowds um, in all 50 states, in many of the major cities across America, so not just in the Midwest, where I currently find myself, but in Washington, D.C. in particular, there were very large protests. And then you saw the president of the United States and members of his cabinet go to the church across Lafayette Square from the White House for a photo op. And the way that that photo op was set up was that protesters were cleared from the square using riot control techniques, including tear gas or tear gas equivalents, right? And that created an additional amount of public pressure. And you saw the protests grow over a period of time to where you saw tens of thousands of people on the street in Washington, D.C. over the course of the past weekend. That also coincided with response to the protests in many of these major cities from police forces and other local security forces around the country that were additional examples of police brutality. And so that has created a continuance of a national conversation about where that issue goes over the course of the next six months. It's also magnified by the fact that, frankly, we're in a presidential election cycle, and that election is going to happen in November. So that's also, I think, important context to keep in mind when you mix together all of the factors as to why we've had the moment that we've had here in the United States in the last two weeks. So as you say, you've got protests that are driven by police brutality against Black Americans. You've got police brutality in response to the protests. The other thing that's really been striking is that when you see these police, and I'm not even talking about when you get the National Guard in Washington, D.C., just the regular police. And I remember this from Ferguson some years back back. They don't look like police, right? I mean, when did America's police turn into something that could probably take on the average armed forces of some country or other? I mean, how did that happen? Right. So this is a complicated answer, but DOD has sought for a number of years to use a transfer authority called the 1033 program, which is a fancy way of saying it's a legal authority that allows the Department of Defense to transfer excess DOD equipment to federal and state law enforcement agencies, initially for counter-drug activities, but now more broadly. This was initially set in motion as a law in 1990 and 1991, but it allows them to acquire, as DOD says on its website, all law enforcement agencies to acquire property for bona fide law enforcement purposes that assist in arrest and apprehension mission. What it has led to is 
is armored vehicles, what are called mine-resistant anti-personnel or MRAPs, and body armor, helmets, personal defense weapons. I mean, I personally have been very struck by the images of these police in places like New York, Philadelphia, even Washington, D.C., even leaving aside the discussion of the National Guard deployment, right? But it just, they look like military police forces, much more like an Italian Carabinieri, for instance, right? So when you see the Carabinieri deployed in Italy, that is much more of the kind of example that I would think of in this context. But it's quite striking. And for whatever reason, this moment has drawn that program that has helped. And by the way, that's not the only thing I think probably that has helped create this over-militarized atmosphere with police in the United States, but it's certainly an important part of why those police forces look the way that they do today. I've spent a chunk of my career looking at security sector reform issues, including police reform in other countries, in Liberia, in Afghanistan. You know, we don't actually always use the U.S. for best practices. We often use other countries for best practices. But it's really striking to see just how far off of these best practices what is visible both in behavior that spurred the protests and in the response to the protests, just how far away from these best practices the United States itself seems to be. What do you think this is going to do for America's efforts to support reform globally? Yeah, well, I think this is an important question to discuss for sure. And I think to me, the answer that I have to that is, it certainly in the short term makes things more difficult, right? You can't help but think of officers who are going out and doing security sector reform missions where the United States is partnering with militaries overseas and saying, um, don't be over-militarized in your response. Don't put these protests down violently. Don't use riot control techniques on peaceful protesters, right? It just So in the short term, it creates an immediate kind of reactionary response. I think the other thing you will see is that this message increasingly gets used by U.S. adversaries in their messaging and response when the U.S. tries to respond to global events without calling out any specific. You can imagine countries that have been adversaries of the United States, more perceived adversaries of the United States, using this in their messaging and propaganda and rhetoric, saying the U.S. is no, you know, no different than we are, and they do the same thing. And that fundamentally makes the preservation of these kinds of norms and values that much harder. It's not to say that the United States has always been the best example of pushing these kinds of norms out there, but I think there has been an intentionality about that in the past that I think is notable and to be lauded. And I think that there's a there's an open question as to the long-term implications of something like this, because again, this kind of incident, as you so rightly identified, Olya, has been a, a feature of the conversation in the United States for an extended period and something that we have reckoned with or not in various forms and fashions for a number of different instances and, in, and over a number of decades. So I think it remains, the long-term impacts remain to be seen, but there will be an initial reaction for sure. Dan, you looked back a bit and said this is part of a trend, but uh, in a sense, you mentioned these uh, U.S. officials going out to other lands and trying to train them to do better. You yourself were one of these officials in the White House National Security Council. You've been an expert on Yemen. You've worked on counterterrorism. Do you feel that we're in a turning point for you personally? Do you feel that it's that big an issue that we're seeing in the United States right now? Or do you think it's just a feverish moment that will pass and things will just go back to the way they were before? Or does this spotlight on this really quite extraordinary series of murders actually make you feel that uh, things are really going to change? So I think it remains to be seen how quickly the change will come. But I do think the unique circumstances that we find ourselves in has created a, a national conversation around these issues that for any number of reasons didn't exist before. I mean, and one example of that, as you have seen already in Minneapolis, the city in which George Floyd was killed, the city council has made a public commitment, majority of the members, to fundamentally rethink the way that they do citizen security there. And that involves disbanding the current structure of the police department. Now, what ultimately reforms get enacted and what that looks like on the local level, that'll be a case-by-case -case basis. But just the fact that you've seen, again, in a, in a relatively short period, 10 days to two weeks, depending on how you define the start of the protests in the end, a significant amount of pressure created to take action. And I think that that pressure does not abate, as I do think that the United States over the past number of years has become, at least in a political sense, that much more sort of out into factions and camps. And so that has made the sort of the political conversation more fractured, and I think uh, shined a sharper light on some of these really core issues that exist at the level of our society in the United States. One of the things we look at these videos of people being murdered 
And we think that's the event. And then we realize that that's the event that somebody had a camera for. That's the event where somebody managed to get their phone out and take the video. How much more often does this happen when nobody is videotaping and you talk to folks, you talk to black people in America and they tell you, oh, all the time, this happens all the time. They don't kill you, they arrest you. I mean, I think it's uh, not to get on a soapbox here. I mean, one of the other things that struck me is we've seen a lot of sympathy protests around the world, both protests of solidarity and also efforts uh, in some countries to reckon with their own history, with their own practices against people of color in places where the majority white places, statues coming down of slave traders and genocidal rulers and so forth and so on. Two questions. I mean, the first question, I suppose, is, you know, what does that say about how the rest of the world looks at America? Let's start with that one. So I think the rest of the world has certainly, depending on which countries you're talking about, always cast a sort of wary eye towards the United States as an actor in the conflict context and towards its role in the international norms. But, you know, I think that there are also countries, frankly, that are going to continue to rely on the United States as an important actor in any number of multilateral institutions. It's still economically, militarily, politically a major force and has the impact to impact major global institutions. So I think you will see most countries, at least in the short term, tread very carefully around these questions and how they respond. But it can create tensions, right? And one good example of that is the potential for, you know, discussion or action at the UN Human Rights Council. You will have seen that the American Civil Liberties Union filed a letter on behalf of the families of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and I think it was 600 other organizations that cover human rights around the world asking for a special session on what's occurred and on police violence in the United States. And so, you know, there are a number of important European allies in particular who sit on the Human Rights Council. I'm thinking of Germany, Denmark, Holland, a number of others. It's not to be exclusive of anyone. But you know, let's say that their diplomats in Geneva are asked to comment or give statements on what's occurred if a special session were to be occurred. You can imagine that creating some additional tension with the United States and in an environment where things are not really functioning as well as they have over the life of the sort of transatlantic alliances relationship in the post-World War II world. You can imagine this being an additional tension or flashpoint. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we are talking to Dan Schneiderman about what's going on in the United States. Is there a way of also looking at this as a form of American leadership that so many countries look at what happens in America and it spurs their people to action, not to go all American exceptionalism, but kind of the extent to which the United States is watched by everybody always, and the also the extent to which these protests, although you're seeing some terrible responses to them, you're also, people keep coming out into the streets, right? That Americans do take their democracy seriously and are willing to fight for it. Is, is there a story there? I think there is, Olya, and I think you're right to point it out. I think the way I would crystallize it from my perspective is this, despite how awful what happened in Lafayette Square was and how awful some of the responses from local police forces around the country have been to these protests, you have also, as you said, seen them continue. And you have seen, as I also highlighted, that these peaceful protests have resulted in political pressure and action. You know, not just in Minneapolis, but you have seen the campaigns are being forced to respond to these issues. Congress, I have seen the House and Senate Democrats are looking at major police reform packages, right? So this is a moment to say, you know, to the rest of the world, look, you know, this is a serious and, and ugly issue, but we're not sweeping it under the rug in that sense. And we're, we're trying to confront it and deal with it. And that's not to say that this is going to be the beginning of the solution to all of the problems that we have, again, that are so fundamental and deep lying here in America. But it is a moment to say that, like, at least at some level, we are starting to talk about them. And that's an important signal to the rest of the world in this moment, I think. Have, it, have any of the reactions surprised you, Dan? So I wouldn't say they've surprised me. I would say the whole situation has surprised me. I would say the thing that has surprised me the most is that the murder of George Floyd has combined with all of these other elements to create a moment for action. And that dramatic, drastic nature of how many people have been in the streets, the quality of those protests, how multi-ethnic they have been. And again, this is from my own anecdotal observation, so take it with a grain of salt. But it just seems like this is a moment and a movement that crosses, at least to some level, socioeconomic strata and political strata in the United States. 
and is creating energy that I think can sustain itself at least over the next few months to drive real potential change in action. So what does that do to U.S. foreign policy? You're talking about does the government get consumed with this and start ignoring the rest of the world? What happens? So I think there are two different elements that we should talk about here. One is the executive branch response and one is the congressional branch response. And they're tied together, but they are somewhat different. So I think let's talk about the executive branch response first. I think that there is a limited amount of bandwidth in any given day for the most senior U.S. officials to deal with issues on their plate, right? And to do things that are very complicated and hard in a foreign policy sense requires a lot of time and effort. Now, this issue is certainly going to remove some of the time in the day that President Trump and his advisors would spend on thinking about issues like Iran or trade or China or any of the other big things that come up in the course of a day when it comes to foreign policy. So I do think it limits bandwidth and action in the foreign policy sense. And on the congressional side of things, the real sort of pressure that I think it creates is that over a number of years, there has been less, frankly, legislating getting done in the terms of passing individual bills right, and having them signed into law. The legislative action and energy goes into the must-pass legislation. So for those who are listening, it's the defense authorization bill that gives the U.S. Defense Department its ability to act and have rules and regulations that govern how it behaves, and then the appropriations bills, which provide money to the departments and agencies of the U.S. government to be able to carry out their daily activities and keep the lights on and for people to get their salaries and go to work. And so those things that you know they're going to move every year, there's intense political pressure, especially uh, the appropriations have to go or the government doesn't open. The defense authorization, in theory, could stop. But there is now a 59-year tradition of passing that bill consecutively every year. And neither political party, I don't think, wants to be seen as the one to end that tradition. So there's going to be intense pressure to make sure that those bills move and get done. How does this mix with the current conversation that we're happening? It means that there's going to be less interest in doing controversial foreign policy mechanisms on these must-pass pieces of legislation. And there's going to be less political energy in Congress to try to make pushes to get those things on because they're going to be spending political capital on things like police reform. So I think it means that Congress in the short term has less energy and attention um, to place on foreign policy issues as a whole. And by the way, that also combines with the fact that the pie was already smaller as a result of Congress trying to deal with responding domestically to the COVID-19 outbreak, right? So the pie was already small. I think it gets that much smaller and it's that much harder for Congress to be able to actually exert real influence and impact on foreign policy, especially in the next six months. So you say especially in the next six months, right? So we've got an executive branch that's too busy for foreign policy and we've got a legislative branch that's too busy for foreign policy. What happens after after the election? And does it matter who is elected? You know, if Joe Biden is elected, does everything go back to normal? Or do these same factors limit what his administration is going to do in foreign policy? So I don't know that it, frankly, to me, that it matters if there is a change in presidential administration or not when it comes to how much time and energy is going to be tied up in dealing with these fundamental issues around racism and police brutality and reform, structural reform of how we do citizen security. I think those are going to be enduring issues. I think it remains to be seen how much energy that sort of movement has to keep going beyond the next few months. So I would say, wait and see and ask me in six months where I think we are. But I do think it is going to be an enduring part of the national conversation here. I just think it has broken through in such a way in the living rooms of America. And again, this is also where I highlight the sort of multi-ethnic, multi-age nature of the way that the protests have come about. I just think people are talking about it across the spectrum of American life. And so I think there is going to continue to be time and energy that needs to get poured into it, both from the executive branch and from the legislative branch. Dan, you've, you've spoken a lot about the energy at a high level. And there you are in Illinois and the heart of America. Can you give us a, just a flavor of what you've personally seen that is informing that sense that there's a real change happening there? Sure. So this is one anecdotal personal example here in Highland Park, Illinois, where I currently find myself, there was a peaceful protest over the course of the weekend, which I attended. And this is a community that, again, is pretty progressive as things go. But again, as I have said to other folks like you, would, you, it is a little bit outside of the big city context, right, where people are really feeling the impacts of COVID. It's also not an extremely diverse place. But this protest had, I want to say, from my own personal estimate, somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 people showing up. And it was really clear that it was members of the community that were out in the streets, you know, talking about no justice, no peace and Black Lives Matter and these kind of things that have become, you know, part and parcel of the discussion in the national sense. Right. And so that made it very hyper 
very hyper local for me in a sense. And I think indicated and give me, at least from my own anecdotal perspective, a sense that there is some impact that this moment is having, even in places where police brutality incidents aren't as prevalent or aren't felt, where the economic impacts of COVID aren't being and the public health impacts of COVID aren't being experienced in such a drastic, direct way. It's fascinating, right? Because the problems have been with the United States for a very, very long time. And we can talk about the militarization of the police as being fairly recent, but certainly the uh, police attitudes towards Black Americans are nothing new. And again, you know, as I said, videotapes has the ability of everybody to have their own camera has changed how much we see it, but none of this is new. And we have, you know, we've all had cell phones for a long time. It's really striking, I think, that this is happening now. Yeah, I agree. And I think that we can't underestimate the impact of social media, by the way, on the current moment that we're experiencing, right? Because people can just connect to these images of the protests and the things that are happening at the protests, the clearing of Lafayette Square, for instance. I mean, there are just so many people who had individual phones out. And as soon as riot police showed up and tear gas canisters started to be shot out, you know, people can record that and make other people in other parts of America experience it in a very visceral way. Another good example of that is this National Guard helicopter. For those who aren't aware of our listeners, there was a National Guard helicopter that hovered down and came very close to the ground in Washington, D.C. And there's good video out there of this. And this is a technique that the U.S. military uses in war zones and other places to clear hostile crowds because helicopters come down and create a lot of wind and and get things flown up and flick, flicking things around, making it hard for people to breathe and move. And so the crowds then are encouraged to disperse. And so to see something like that happen, it's one thing to read about it, and it's another thing to see it on camera and to experience it and feel the visceral nature that you get from a visual and from the sound. I just think it connects people to what's happening. And again, I think contributes to this very unique moment of experiencing this as an as a country, as a nation that we're having right now. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. This was a fascinating conversation. And I have no doubt that what goes on in the United States, even if the US becomes less active in foreign policy as a result, the eyes of the world will continue to be on America as it sorts through this tremendous challenges that have been ignored for far too long. Thank you so much. Thank you also to all of our listeners, of course, to Bull Media, our producer. War and Peace is a podcast of the Europod Network. Big thanks to Miranda Sonnex, who makes sure that we stay on schedule and have everything we need to record, and we will be back with you in two weeks. Goodbye from me as well, Hugh Pope, your co-host, and you can follow some of Dan's work and the America program's work and our latest statement on what happened in the United States on www.crisisgroup.org. Goodbye. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.